Catholic Conversations with Jason Bramley on Catholic Spirit Radio 89.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the generous support of Meyer Bramley Insurance, serving Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas. Meyer Bramley Insurance can be reached online at mbi.agency or via phone at 844-890-2626. Catholic Conversations, where we talk about faith, family, and finance. We are back, Catholic Conversations, with Jason Bramley on Catholic Spirit Radio 89.5. We have a fantastic guest with us today. Uh, Peter Kwasniewski is with us. Peter, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Did I get that pronunciation close? You did. Awesome, Perfect. awesome. Well, I, pre- <laughs> I appreciate you being with us. For those folks who might not be aware, uh, Peter writes for, for just about everybody in the, in the Catholic world, right? Uh, LifeSite News and 1 Peter 5 and... All the liturgical kind of, movement, yeah, yeah, uh, very, various other places too. Absolutely, you must, you must uh, just spend most days in front of the computer typing away. Yes, well, unfortunately, I, I, I wish I could just, um, you know, spin the articles out of my head and not have to be in front of the screen so much. But, uh, but I love writing and I love what I do, so it's fine. The, the topics are probably the easy part, right? It's the getting them all researched and written out and the way you want them. Yes, that's right. And there's there's really never enough time to read all the books that one wants to <laughs> wants to read. So now, for folks who who might not uh, know who you are, you are not a convert to the faith, as we so typically it seems like have on the show or on here on different shows. You're a cradle Catholic. That's right. That's right. Although I do like to consider myself a kind of revert, but we can talk about that if you want. Yeah, abs- absolutely. It, it, uh, for folks who might not be familiar, Revert is someone who was born and raised Catholic, but kind of fell away for a while and came back. Uh, wh- how, does, how does that work in your life? What's that story look like? You know, for, for me, um, it, it's, it's, uh, maybe I need to, need to think of a different term, like, like Tradvert or something like that. It's I was really going to say, because you didn't really ever fall away, no, right? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I had, I had a period in, in college when when I went through some personal um, issues that, I mean, I didn't, I never stopped believing, let's put it that way. I never stopped believing, but, um, but I definitely had to sort out some issues in my life um, before I could really fully recommit myself. Um, But really the form it took for me is going from a kind of uh, low, lower commitment Catholicism, um, a more, a more secularized version of it to a more, um, a more integral and uh, uh, total commitment to the faith, and that that really just that just happened in 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 phases. It happened because of discovering theology. I mean that there is such a thing as theology, which is kind of a hidden uh, secret. Um, you know that there's a real depth to what to what the Catholic faith proclaims and teaches, um, and then and then discovering the traditional liturgy, which um, made it all come come alive and 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 you know in in a kind of uh, splendor that I hadn't seen before. And so that was you know. I, I feel like my faith was in danger of um, petering out, if I could put it that way, and uh, and that it, it needed to be reanimated by by some really huge uh, impulse or shock from the outside. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think you might be onto something with the uh, what would you call it, the tradvert that you might yeah. <laughs> you, you might be able to coin that phrase. <laughs> yeah. for, now, for you, I've I've seen some interviews, and for you, my my guess is that Gregorian chant played a big role in that, bringing you kind of more deeply into the to the faith is that right yes it it did it did and and in a strange way too because i didn't discover chant as part of the liturgy as as you know it's unfortunately still rather rare um I and mean, you have to kind of go out of your way to find it but um but i discovered it just as as music um as as art really and not not knowing what it's history or function was, um, I, I became really mesmerized with it, just listening to recordings of it and, and learning more about it. And, and for, for a while, I thought it was just something medieval that, you know, I mean, kind of, kind of like the clothing that medieval people wore. It's beautiful, but nobody wears it anymore. And you know, so I, I didn't really know where it came from. I just, I just was really um, spellbound by it uh, as an art form. And then when I discovered, uh, lo and behold, you know, this, this is the music of the Catholic liturgy. It has been for so many centuries, and it still is supposed to be be, according to Vatican II, um, one of those bits that people don't talk about so much, uh, you know, then, then, then I actually was able to encounter it um, in the wild, so to speak, um, at, at Mass. Uh, when, when, when that happened, then, you know, boy, the fireworks started going off. Yep, yeah, this is right. <laughs> this is, now this has it's the right sacred circle. feeling. Yeah. 
You know, when I converted 11 years ago, I've made the the comparison that the faith is really like that mustard seed that that grows into the huge um, bush that, you know, when as a convert, when I was going through RCA, I didn't really have any idea about the Catholic faith as compared to the things that I've learned over the last, you know, 10 or 12 years. And, and I think that there's a lot of similarity in that between the Novus Ordo Mass, which is the mustard seed as compared to the traditional Latin Mass, which is the depth and the beauty and the fullness of the of the bush. And so that's why I'd ask you to, to come on here with us, because I, I am just new to this whole traditional Latin Mass idea. I've been once, uh, and we have a group that's trying to bring the Latin Mass here to our local community. And so I know a lot of folks just probably aren't familiar with the with the concept of why anybody would be interested or what mm-hmm. you know what would be the historical background and so a lot of folks said hey you should call Peter he he's the guy that <laughs> that would be able to help answer some of those questions for for the local community sure sure well if if you don't mind my just commenting on on the the metaphor that we've been using about the seed um the mustard seed and the and the great bush um you know the 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 reality is that the liturgy started off um, well. Even the Jewish temple liturgy was fairly elaborate, um, and the synagogue liturgy as well was was chanted in a sacred language, Hebrew. Um, but it was still relatively simple compared to what the Catholic liturgy was destined to become after many centuries of growth and development. And so, what what the apostles were doing um, after the ascension of our Lord, when they gathered together and celebrated the Eucharist, read, read scripture, was fairly simple. It was like the mustard seed. But the Lord never intended it to stop there and just sort of like freeze frame mustard seed. Okay, that's it. You've got the essentials. Nothing more is needed. It, it was meant to grow and develop in beauty and in splendor and in majesty. And that's what happened. It just happened inevitably, I would say, century by century, as, especially after Christianity became legal, the liturgy really just it just burgeoned and, and grew in so many different ways, musically, architecturally, ceremonially, um, and so you find you ended up with in the Middle Ages really, like let's say like the life of Saint Thomas Aquinas, Saint Francis, Saint Louis of France, all these great saints from the Middle Ages. The liturgy had achieved at that point that uh, fullness that that the parable talks about, you know, and, and uh, even the birds of, of the heavens could nest in its branches, you know, it was just the angels, so to speak, were nesting in its branches. So there was such a fullness to the liturgy. And the weird thing is that in the 20th century after World War II, when the liturgists wanted to reform the liturgy, their leading idea, or at least what they said was their leading idea, was we have to get back to the simplicity of what the early Christians were doing. Um, and in a way, they were saying, let's go back to the mustard seed, which to me doesn't make any sense. You know, that, that doesn't fit with the way that, that, uh, that realities grow. Right. So, yes, I wouldn't want to unlearn all the things that I've learned about the Catholic faith at this point in my life. You're right. <laughs> it wouldn't yeah. do me any good. Yeah, and, and I mean, another comparison that I think is helpful for people is, um, you know, you look at the history of creeds, the creeds that, uh, that Catholics use, um, and they get longer. I mean, not surprisingly. So if you look at the Apostles' Creed, which is the most ancient one we have and the, and the one that we still pray before the Rosary, um, it's short. I mean, it's really short um, and easy to memorize. Uh, and that, you know, that's what was used for many centuries. But then you got to the Council of Nicaea in 325, and because of heresies that had arisen, the Church needed to say, okay, what we've always believed is being attacked now, so now we're going to formulate it more clearly and more fully, so that there's no mistaking what the Church holds. Um, and so then the, the Creed became longer, the Council of Constantinople added some extra bits to the Creed, and that now is the Creed that we say on Sundays, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. And if you put it next to the Apostles' Creed, you can see it follows the same outline, but it, it fills it in more. Um, and then, you know, there are other creeds, too. There's the Athanasian Creed, so-called Athanasian Creed, which is said, um, which had been said quite often in the past. Now it's kind of fallen into disuse. But that one's very, you know, much longer than the Nicene Creed. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the Creed of the Council of Trent and the Credo of the People of God of Paul the Sixth, And all of these later creeds, they end up being longer. They're not saying anything different, but they're saying it more fully. And so it would be really strange to, for us to say, oh, well, you know, the Apostles' Creed was good enough, wasn't it, for, you know, for the Apostles? So why don't we just forget about all these other creeds? We would never do that. Yeah, absolutely. For folks that might not, you know, be familiar with how we got here, for either, you know, converts to the faith or, or really just, I mean, it, Vatican II was now, what, almost 70 years ago? 
60, yeah, well, yeah, 60, let's say. 60 yeah. years ago. And so for, for the vast majority of people, even that are cradle Catholics, they probably don't remember pre-Vatican II. And so can you give us a little bit of historical perspective on how did we move from the traditional Latin Mass into what's now the Novus Ordo? Yes. Yes, that's a big question, but let me, let me see if I could do a good job of, of, of giving the nutshell version. So, um, so yeah, so as I was saying, the liturgy did develop uh, slowly, um, step by step from century to century, and you have something that is recognizably the, the Trinity, well, let's, let's say the, the, the traditional Latin Mass. Um, uh, you have something recognizably of that form and content in the High Middle Ages. Okay, so, so let's say a thousand years after... The liturgy was, was translated into Latin in the 4th century. We can get into that later if you're interested. But from that time, about over a period of about 1,000 years, you have the development of what we would call the traditional Latin Mass or the, the classical Roman Rite. Um, and that was codified, that was put into a kind of definitive form in 1570 by Pope St. Pius V. Um, and that's why it's often called the Tridentine Mass, because it was connected with the Council of Trent. That, that, that act of Pius V was connected with Trent, um, and Tridentine is the adjective for Trent. So, so then the Mass really hardly changed for 400 years after that. Very stable, um, and I think the reason for that is that it had reached a certain fullness and perfection, and it didn't need to develop anymore. And that's something you see in the history of all liturgies. They, they stop developing at a certain point, because to develop them further would make them too long or too elaborate. Or, and basically, they just, they just do what they're supposed to do very well. So, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, right. so it remains stable for all these centuries. But in the 20th century, especially, there was a growing conviction among, on the part of some scholars uh, and liturgists in particular that, uh, you know, they thought modern men, modern man needed something different from this. This is too old, too obscure, too difficult. Um, you know, it doesn't speak to his contemporary concerns. Uh, you know, and, and they were, in a sense, they felt like the traditional Latin Mass had ceased to to speak to people where they're at. You know, that's that's at least what they said. It's not completely clear to me that that was true. I don't think that was entirely true, but, but nevertheless, that was their theory. And um, there was enough support for at least the idea of a moderate reform of the liturgy that would involve things like in, introducing some of the vernacular, some of the, the common languages of the people, not exclusively, but just introducing that um, into the Mass is one example. So there was enough support for these kind of ideas that when the Second Vatican Council was convened, one of the items on the agenda was liturgical reform. Um, and, you know, John the Twenty Third put that item on the agenda. Um, going into the Council, uh, it's, the bishops had not expressed any desire to make a wholesale change to the liturgy. They were talking about tweaking it in this way or that. And when you look at the Constitution on the liturgy that was promulgated in 1963, that was the first of the 16 documents of Vatican II, um, it's actually, in many ways, fairly moderate. Um, that is, most people would be surprised reading it now at what happened afterwards, because what happened afterwards was of such a magnitude greater than what the document talks about. Um, so, you know, when the 2,000-plus bishops and superiors voted on that document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, they thought they were going to have the Tridentine Mass with some vernacular in it, with a little bit of simplification, um, you know, and, and so that's what they thought they were getting, and many of them were really surprised, <laughs> to say the least, that 10 years later that was, that was almost completely gone, uh, kind of banished, and something very, very different uh, was put in its place, different in terms of how it looked, how it sounded, how it felt. So I, I, you can ask me more questions about that. That's just my, my attempt to put it into a nutshell. So I guess I've, I've heard, uh, I don't know if they're rumors, or, but I've heard, I've heard this thing floating around the Internet, that the Novus Order was originally scribbled down on the back of, like, a bar napkin. <laughs> okay, so there is a true story in there, but it's, it's, it's not about the Novus Order in general. That, that would be very difficult to fit onto any number of napkins. True, but, true. But it's, it's about the second Eucharistic prayer, um, which unfortunately is... Is tends to be overused even even today, um, even after all that we know. Um, so, the the traditional Latin Mass has one Eucharistic prayer. It on, the the Roman Church only ever had one prayer, and we call it the Roman Canon. Um, and this prayer is, you know, the origins of it are lost lost in the mists of antiquity, as, as we like to say. But I mean, we, we we really can't say where it came from. But we know that it's already being used um, some form of it in the fourth 
and 5th centuries, um, because we have textual evidence to that effect. St. Ambrose, for example, talks about it. Um, and we know it was given some of its final features by Pope St. Gregory the Great, who died in 604. So this is really, really ancient. And unlike in the Eastern Church, where there were several Eucharistic prayers, the Western Church, not just in Rome, but everywhere in the West, you know, from Ireland and France, you know, down to Italy and Northern Africa and whatever, they had one there was one Eucharistic prayer in Latin, the Roman canon. Um, and that remained the case until 1967. So we're talking about, you know, what, 13, 14, 1500 years of the continual use of just one Eucharistic prayer. Um, so what happened? Well, to put it simply, the liturgists I was talking about before, they said, well, you know, the Roman canon, okay, it's old and venerable, but it doesn't really express all the truths about about the Eucharist and the Church that we want, that we think need to be expressed. Um, it's partial, you know, like anything we do is partial. So we need some more expressions of, of different aspects of, of the Eucharist and the Church. And so we're going to write some new Eucharistic prayers that bring out those other aspects. Um, and so pretty shockingly, I would say, because of what I just related about the history, Paul VI gave them the green light and said, yeah, you can put together some more Eucharistic prayers, you know, just make sure you're using ancient sources so that you have some kind of input from the tradition. Um, and so the new Eucharistic prayers that were composed, most of them have some kind of model in ancient texts. And the second Eucharistic prayer had a model in an ancient text by uh, a man named Hippolytus, or they, they thought the text was by Hippolytus. There's debate about that now. Um, so they, there's this old text by Hippolytus, or attributed to him, and they took that, and a couple of scholars, uh, one of whom was pretty famous, Louis Bouillet, um, they were asked to redact or edit that text and kind of make it into a usable Eucharistic prayer. And that's what they finished uh, in haste uh, on napkin in a cafe in Trastevere in, gotcha. in Rome. Um, and Louis Bouillet talks about that in his memoirs. So as if to say, you know, it was kind of ridiculous just the way things happened um, because it was so rushed and, you know, so so rushed. Yeah. So, so there's also this kind of uh, subscription of belief that the Novus Ordo that was laid out during Vatican II is not what we have today, and that you can you can celebrate the Novus Ordo in a very reverent way, uh, and that we've just kind of digressed or progressed. I guess it depends on how you look at it, but we we've diverged from what the original was. Do do you subscribe to the idea that the original was efficacious in its in what it was trying to accomplish, or I mean? If we were sure, doing well, it one way for 1,900 yeah. years, it seems like we, we, we had figured it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that, I mean, that's, of course, as, a, as somebody who would call himself a traditionalist, um, I would say if the, church does some, if, it, if the church does something for 1,500 years or more, um, you know, obviously not everything in the Trentine Mass is that old, but if we're doing something for 500 years or 1,000 years or 1,500 years, and the church is growing, which the church always has been during those periods, then we're not doing something wrong with our liturgy. In fact, that's what divine providence has led us to, and that's what the Holy Spirit wishes. Um, so, I mean, it seems to me that that's a very safe bet, yeah. and that it's also safe because every church has always acted that way. What I, what I mean is all the Eastern churches, like the Eastern Catholic churches and the Eastern Orthodox, um, and really all the Eastern churches, whether they're in union with Rome or not, they've always held very tightly to their liturgical tradition, and they don't change it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, that, and the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, was exactly the same way for all those centuries. I mean, nobody would have dreamed of turning things upside down. So something really weird did happen in the middle of the 20th century, um, you know, from the basically after World War II and leading into the Council. There was this very strange, I would even go so far as to say, um, un-Catholic, questioning of our tradition and history and just saying, you know, something's gone really wrong. Um, well, you know, if you start saying that, I think you're not that far away from the Protestants who talk about how the, you know, the church went off the rails at a certain point, you know, right. like everything was fine until the church started venerating the relics of saints or everything was fine until the church, you know, made the liturgy the privilege of a, of a clerical case that spoke Latin, you know, the Protestant textbooks are filled with this kind of language. And it, it's, it's worrisome when you start hearing Catholics saying that kind of thing, right? Right. <laughs> um, but to get to your question, it, it's important to note this. Vatican II didn't propose a liturgy as such. There was no sketch put forward of this is what the liturgy should look like. There was a proposal for reform and some principles of reform, 
uh, and then some particular ideas. So it was a kind of schema for a, an, for, for a reform that was to take place after the Council. So that, Vatican II never issued a liturgy, and the Novus Ordo isn't the liturgy of Vatican II. It just kind of it, grew out of... Yeah. So what, what they did was they said, for example, um, you know, Vatican II claimed uh, that in the centuries, maybe some elements in the liturgy had become obscure or had become overgrown with, um, you know, needless complications, and so those could be simplified. So they, they talked about simplification. Uh, it talked about the use of the vernacular, the limited use of the vernacular could be helpful. Um, it talked about, but it still said, retain Latin and, and give chant the, the pride of place. Um, so the, and then it said, whatever, you know, whatever changes are made should be um, should 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 come should seem to be organic. There should be no rupture, no appearance of of, break, of a break. So it, it, the council put forward, I think, some reasonable proposals. Although of course they were general and therefore vague and subject to different interpretations. And what really happened is that the people who implemented the reform after the council, the, a, a group called the Concilium, which was led by this figure named Annibale Bunini. Um, that concilium really, you know, they were given an inch and they took a mile or 10 miles, you know. They really went way beyond what um, the document said or what anybody had anticipated. And so even if you can, even if you can celebrate the Novus Ordo that that committee developed or, or produced, even if you can celebrate it reverently, it's still in itself quite a departure from what the Church had been doing before. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I and again, having only gone once, uh, I can only you know give a very limited, um, a, a very limited uh, perspective. However, I get one of the things that always shocks me is the the use of the word extraordinary. And so at my parish, we have extraordinary ministers of the Holy Eucharist, which I literally see every day at yes, daily yes. mass. And yet, if I wanted to see the extraordinary form yeah. of the mass, right. I would have to drive forty five minutes. Uh, one true. day a week. It, I, I find it, I mean, words matter, right? Yeah, in, the, in this, Let's put it this way. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's, there is something, there's something Orwellian uh, about the use of language at times. Um, yeah, so extraordinary, I, I actually have a chapter in, in my book, Noble Beauty, Transcendent Holiness, that goes into this, into all the linguistic, all the terminological questions about, you know, what is the Latin Mass, the Tridentine Mass, the, you know, the Usus Antiquior, the extraordinary form, you know, what's going on with all this language and what does it mean? Um, but the, the fact is that, that extraordinary means something different in those two cases. So in, in the case of the extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, it's really clear when you study the documents that what they mean is this is something out of the ordinary. It's not what's supposed to happen. It's only, it's only supposed to happen in an emergency. Sure. Um, let's say that you've got a Mass celebrated by uh, a priest who's 100 years old. He can barely stand up. He finishes, you know, giving himself communion, and he has to sit down, or he's going to keel over. Okay, you know, extraordinary minister of Holy Communion in that situation could be helpful, right? But, but it's, not, it's not the... Today, you know, this weekend, it's, you know, these six people are scheduled to, you know, be EMHCs. I mean, that's, that is so bizarre. If you look at the actual legislation, you know, they're not supposed to be habitually or routinely used. Right. Um, so that's one meaning. But another meaning of extraordinary is a sociological meaning. That is, this is not the ordinary manner in which most Catholics are worshiping. Um, it's out of the ordinary. And that's, that's the way Benedict XVI was speaking in Summorum Pontificum. He was simply describing the situation where the vast majority of Catholics are using the Novus Ordo, but there are Catholics who want to use the older form of worship. And so I'm going to call that the forma extraordinaria, you know, the, the, the form of Mass that's outside of the ordinary experience of Catholics. And what I think is important about that point is that as the extraordinary form actually grows in popularity, and it is growing in popularity, there are some Catholics for whom that's going to become the ordinary form of their worship, right? I mean, I know, I know kids now who've grown up their whole lives with only the traditional Latin Mass. I mean, they, they were born into it. It's been around long enough now, that is the rediscovery of it, has been around long enough that you have kids getting married and having families who have only ever attended the traditional Latin Mass. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, to call it at that point extraordinary is just uh, a bit of a stretch for them, for those sure. people. It's ordinary for them. Um, and that's why, you know, I think the terminology ordinary, extraordinary isn't really that helpful. I mean, I can see why Benedict 
did it. Um, but I think as time goes on, it's, it just, it's not really the language that's going to stick. So. so to give us a little historical perspective on Vatican II, I guess, what, what was the climate in the church like prior to Vatican II? I think at this point, it's probably very easy for people to look back and say, oh my gosh, we've had 60 years of decline in numbers yeah. and, and irreverence, yeah. and here's all the things that happened during Vatican II. The, the church wasn't booming in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, however, right? I mean, there was a reason that we had Vatican II and that the, these ideas took hold. Where, well, where was the church at kind of yeah. pr- prior to that? Okay, so yes, this is a good question. It's a very good question. Um, on the contrary, the church was booming in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, so okay. there, was, there was a steady growth rate going, especially during the pontificate of Pius XII. And if people want to see that, you know, not just take my word for it, um, there's, if, if you go online and you search for Pius XII statistics, um, and maybe you need to, you might need to throw in uh, Rorate Celi because that's where that's the blog where it appeared. Um, you'll see this very impressive chart of the numbers of religious vocations of uh, seminarians and priests of dioceses and missionary territories and so on. There's a chart that compares what it was when Pius XII became Pope in 1939. And at the end of his pontificate, I think around 1958 is when this chart goes to. And the growth is just spectacular. I mean, it's like through the roof growth um, in that period from 1939 to 1959, let's say, 59. Um, and, you know, the pro- but, but that being said, uh, there was a beginning to be a decline in the 1960s. Um, in some places, in some parts of the Western world, by the time Vatican II was meeting, that crest the, the church had passed the crest, and you could start to see signs of decline. I think just because, not you know, obviously the '68 sexual revolution and so on was yet to happen, but there was already a kind of, um, you know, solvent or acid of, of liberalism, you know, that was becoming stronger and stronger at that time before it really exploded, um, and that was definitely being felt, and that was a concern that, you know, going into the council, some of the council fathers were saying, you know, what, how can the Catholic Church position itself right now, and how can she explain herself to the world so that we can reach people who are tempted towards secularism, who are tempted by the increasing materialism, you know, that, that prosperity, post-war prosperity is, is making possible. So, yeah, for sure there was a concern about, you know, effective evangelization of the modern world. You know, that's, that's a huge theme of Vatican II. Do you think that any major portion of that increase of, of seminarians during that 20-year period was from um, uh, recruiting from communist sympathizers or those oh. types of things that you hear <laughs> yeah. about? I mean, <laughs> Yes, I, I do think that, I mean, there's no question in my mind, based on the evidence available, that there were some uh, infiltrate, infiltrated priests, some plants, as, as you could call them. Sure. But I don't think Not they, a big enough percentage. Yeah, I don't think it would be statistically significant. Um, and, you know, as for Bella Dodd's claim that there were a thousand, I, she says something like, you know, she talks about, she throws out this number, a thousand communist seminarian plants or whatever. To me, to my historical sense, that just, I can't believe that. That sounds, that sounds kind of unbelievable. I mean, if she if she were able to give more specific evidence, um, but she doesn't, she just throws that out. So yeah. I think that there were, um, and, and unfortunately, I mean, there seems to be evidence that McCarrick is, is one of these, but, but whatever the case may be, um, yeah, I don't think it would have been statistically significant. So. Gotcha. I, I mean, I've been fishing before. I've never caught a fish that was less than a, like a foot and a half long. So. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our historical perspective, especially for our own um, successes in life, I guess, would sometimes are skewed towards the to the positive. Um, yeah. Now, I would say, if I could just return to a yeah. point you were bringing up, um, to me, what's really surprising, I mean, maybe it shouldn't be, but because the Catholic Church is unique in so many ways, uniquely good, um, and I think uniquely stubborn, too, at times, at least as far as her, you know, her members, are, her, her, her uh, hierarchical members are concerned. But, um, but you know, if you, if you look at all the changes, the raft of changes that went, went through in the 1960s, especially, it kind of accelerated from 65 to 75. That, that period was the most intense period of everything changing, you know, Paul VI, you know, he changed all the clerical attire. You know, the, we think Catholic bishops and clergy and so on, we think that they dress in a fancy way. Well, they didn't, there's nothing compared to the way they used to dress. You know, but Paul VI simplified all that. Um, you know, he simplified the liturgies, every single liturgical rite, all seven sacraments, all the blessings. You know, there, there was nothing that was left untouched. 
and and I would say, I mean, the the touching. It wasn't just touching. It was really deeply changing all of these things um, in such a rapid period. So you would think that if during that time of change and all afterwards, if if it was if the evidence was coming in as it was that the church was actually rapidly losing members, rapidly losing clergy and religious and lay people. Um, and then there were just, there were so many stories of horrific abuses in the liturgy and so on. You would, you would think, right, any normal human corporation would say, you know what, we had good intentions, but it's clear that this is not working. We actually need to put the brakes on and go back to what was working before. And even if we're going to suffer some more, it's better to suffer with, you know, with, with our tradition intact than to keep bleeding, you know, with, without it. Right. This is like and, the new Coke argument, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the new Coke argument. So a corporation puts out the new Coke and, and people don't like it. They don't want to drink it. And they say, okay, let's go back to the original classic Coke formula. Right? Yeah. How long did we see the purple ketchup on the shelves? That lasted yeah, yeah. like a week and a half. <laughs> exactly. So that's my, I'm very much an advocate of the new Coke, classic yeah. Coke argument. Um, and it seems to me astonishing that even now after, you know, almost 60 years, um, uh, from from the time that Vatican II started, um, that we're st- that there still doesn't seem to be a widespread acknowledgement or recognition of that reality on the part of the corporate executives, if I can put it that way. Yeah. You know. But anyway, there so we are. I, so. I do think that it seems as though the the uh, at least we we've had a lot of priests on this radio show, and and you know I've talked to a bunch of priests on Twitter and those types of things. It seems that the younger priests, those guys that are more recently out of the seminary that they uh, tend to be much more grounded in that idea that, hey, we've made some errors over the last half century that, you know, hopefully we can correct in the next half century. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you. I, I, have, I, am, I am sort of cautiously optimistic about, about the way things are going. I mean, not, not so much the way things are going at the, at the upper levels, but, but at, the, at the grassroots level, I see a lot of good things happening. Yeah, I mean, at the upper levels, those guys are all like well into their seventies and eighties. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the one benefit is that uh, we always have change due to age. Eventually, um, yeah, it's it's true. It's true. What do you What do you think is m- maybe the one thing that has kind of led us away from reverence in our faith over the last fifty? If you had to pinpoint one change that has happened, yes, that's a great question. Um, I would actually so. Do you mind if I pinpoint three? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay. we, we could always go for an expanded answer. Exactly. Well, just because I, I've, I've wrestled with myself so long about which one of these I think is primary, and I, I, I think that they're, it's like a Trinitarian thing where, they're, where they're, they're, they all need well, to be we do We do subscribe one. to a faith in which things do tend to come in three. So. Yes, exactly. So number one for me is ad orientem, um, that is the Mass being celebrated to the east, um, with the priests and the people facing in the same direction, right? That's that's the traditional way of worship. All mm-hmm. of us facing towards the east, which represents actually several things. It represents Christ. Christ in Scripture is called and compared to the east, the Orient, um, and he says he will come from the east. So when the Christians, the early Christians, faced eastwards towards the rising sun, that for them was the emblem of the the, glor- the glorious risen Christ, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. And the early, you know, the, the earliest form of Sunday, the way that early Christians thought about Sunday was not so much we're going to remember now the resurrection of Jesus so many years ago, but we are looking forward to the second coming of Christ from the East. So that was the original sort of mentality of Easter. It's, it's a forward-looking, it's an eschatological perspective. And so, and the other thing that Ad Orientem represents is that our worship is directed towards God. It's theocentric, it's vertical. It's not a closed circle where the priest is looking at the people and where they're kind of smiling at each other. And it's, you know, there's, it, it's not that. It's, it's everybody is facing towards, symbolically, towards God together. And I think it's very powerful when you attend, when anyone attends Ad Orientum liturgy, they can see, and, and, and it either makes people, it either makes you elated or it makes you frustrated that this is not about me, you know? Right. I'm here to subordinate myself to Christ and to God um, in and through Christ. And so this is... Um, that's, I think that when the priest was turned to face the people based on some very sketchy archaeological theories about early Christian worship, um, it, it just destroyed that sense of 
theocentric, vertical worship, eschatological, you know, pointed towards the end times, pointed towards Christ and the kingdom of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very, very important. Um, And if that alone changed, you know, that is, even if the Novus Ordo with nothing else changing, if the priest and the people did, you know, faced God together at the altar um, of sacrifice, it would, I think that would have a huge psychological impact on what we think we're doing when we go to Mass, right? Um, so that's one point. Another point, the second point would be um, communion on the tongue and kneeling. Um, I think that there's hardly, there's no argument anymore about whether there's a crisis of faith in the real presence. There is a huge, massive crisis of faith, and we saw that with the Pew Research. Yeah, right? Only one-third of Catholics believe in transubstantiation. And Catholics the real who go to church on yeah, a weekly who go to basis. church, right? Yeah. Not just Catholics, anybody. Right. But those who go to church, and even those who know that the church teaches that Christ is really present in the Eucharist still think it's a symbol. Okay, why is that the case? Well, it's not a failure of catechesis. That's, it's not that. It's a failure of the liturgy as the main catechizer to catechize people in the real presence. Because, finally speaking, where the rubber meets the road is every week, every Sunday when people go to Mass, that's their main catechesis. It's not the purpose of Mass to be a catechesis, but it just is, right? It, right. it forms you in the faith. It's the lex orandi, lex credendi. How we pray dictates how we believe. How we believe. Um, so if, if there's many signs of reverence in the Mass, the priest is constantly genuflecting before the Blessed Sacrament. You know, we're all facing eastwards because we're offering up this awesome sacrifice that is the sacrifice of the God-man himself. And if we all kneel in reverence, in adoration, to receive on the tongue, and only the priest handles the body of Christ, if all of those things are in place, we know that this is not just ordinary bread. This is no mere symbol. Nobody treats a symbol like that, yeah. right? Um, you know, people don't kneel in front of a birthday cake, okay? I mean, unless they're, I guess, too short to blow up the <laughs> handles or something. But people don't kneel in front of mere symbols, okay? So... That change in the way that we receive communion has, 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 has been catastrophic, and there's no—that just needs to go. It yeah. needs to go away. I, I would say if I had to pinpoint one, that, that's typically the one I go to. Father Hollowell made the point on Twitter the other day, or I guess he posed the question, as a priest, uh, why, are, why, would, why are my hands consecrated at ordination if, if it, anybody can handle the body of Christ? Right, exactly. No, that's, and that's just, that's just been tragic. It's been tragic because it's not, well, yeah, the tragedy there lies in a, a, a deep misunderstanding of what active participation means. And, and that's, you know, that's a whole separate uh, kettle of fish. But, yeah, that, but I mean, just basically, you know, that to be active in the Mass is to be doing some ministry. That is so false. I mean, the way the, way, the most, the greatest dignity of the Christian is being baptized into the priesthood of Jesus Christ, by which we can offer up our souls and bodies to God as a pleasing act of worship. That's the deepest dignity of the Christian. And that's true for the Pope, and it's true for me and you. And so in the liturgy, the deepest form of active participation is to unite ourselves with Christ in his sacrifice on the cross. That's the deepest form of participation, the most meaningful one. Going and handing out things to people, you know, whatever they are, or collect, taking up a collection or, you know, distributing communion, whatever it is, all of those things are secondary to that that most fundamental form of participation. And in fact, they can be a distraction from it. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah, that. I, but, and that was a specific question that I, that I was going to ask you. So let's get your third one, and then I want to come back oh, to sure. the participation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the, the third one for me is, the, is the, the abandonment of Latin. And I would go, I would add to that Latin chant, because Gregorian chant is an art form that grew up with Latin, and it, it doesn't really work very well outside of Latin. It, it can kind of work. You can do, you can sort of do chant in the vernacular, but basically, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, Italian opera. I mean, it, Italian opera is beautiful in Italian, and it sounds ridiculous if you do it in English, yeah. you know. It's and like so if you it, wrote a poem in English, you, the <laughs> syllables wouldn't line up for you to then do it in, you know, put, a different language, Spanish. Right, exactly. it would, so, the flow so chant, would be off. Gregorian chant is very much a Latin art form. And the thing about Latin that people have to understand, and it takes time. I really want to emphasize this. You know, you said you've, you've been once. I always say this to people. You know, it's going to take you, well, it took, it took 1,600 years for the Church to develop this liturgy, or more, because we don't even know where, how it began. Um, 
it's going to take you your whole life to really fully, you know, you're never going to fully comprehend. You can't comprehend the mysteries of God, and you can't, and the, the liturgy itself has such a depth to it that you can't easily comprehend it either. And so the, the, it takes many, you have to go many, many times and really, really open yourself to the experience and just say, like, this is going to be uncomfortable, and it's going to teach me all kinds of things that I wasn't expecting, things that I don't even understand now that I'm going to learn, I will learn from doing this. It works. It really works, but it takes time and patience. Um, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like a brick wall that you have to climb over to get into the beautiful garden on the other side. You know, there's a, there's an incredible garden on the other side, but there's no gate into it. You have to climb over the wall, and, and it's going to take effort to get into that garden. Um, but for me, the Latin is part of of what I call the 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 sonic iconostasis of the traditional Latin Mass. So it, the, the the iconostasis in a Byzantine church, in an Eastern Catholic church, is the big screen of icons that separates the sanctuary from the nave of the church. So the people sitting in the nave, they look at this huge um, gate, basically a gate covered with icons, and only the priest can enter through it. And once the priest enters through it and the doors have been closed, you can't see him anymore. Okay? That's the way Eastern liturgy works. Um, and so, but in the Western liturgy, we don't have the iconostasis. We don't have a big physical, a big visible barrier. Right. But we have Latin and chant and silence. And the three of those work together to be a sonic iconostasis. That is something that separates us in a way and even distances us, in a way, from the mystery that's taking place at the altar. And paradoxically, right, it's precisely because of that separation and distancing that our faith is animated and enticed, and we, we long for the courts of the Lord. It reminds us that heaven is our final destination, and we're still on earth as pilgrims, right? So we haven't arrived yet. We're not there. We're longing for it. Um, and so that sonic iconostasis is actually a very powerful nourishment of our faith and of our longing for heaven. And so that's those three things. Yeah, I, the, that harkens a lot to kind of like the Holy of Holies back in the temple in Jerusalem, right, that's where, exactly where right. only the priest was able to to go into and so so here's so I was going to ask you this question about participation because you get that a lot I think from folks who are like well I don't I don't understand what what do I do I I can't yes. participate I have to participate it takes me participating uh, I don't is there a, is that a hubris that's evolved in the in the Novus Ordo that says you know maybe subconsciously like the math the mass on its own is not sacrifice enough to God that it takes me participating it takes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, it, yes. and I don't think most people sit around and think that, right? I mean, yes. but but I think back to your point. Maybe it's the ad orienta, maybe it's the receiving, you know, the Eucharist or all the Eucharistic ministers that just says, you know, this isn't this isn't as reverent or this isn't yes. on its own enough. Yeah, yeah. No, I th- I think that what's going on there is, um, it's pretty simple. Um, although what I say is, is probably going to sound kind of kind of harsh, but. But really, I think that what we, the, the way that participation is misunderstood simply results from the modern penchant for activism. Um, what I mean by activism is that um, in order for something to be real and important, we have to be doing it ourselves. We have to be the agents. We have to be the movers and shakers. And if we're not doing it, then it must not be very important or something like that. Yeah. Um, and the opposite of activism is receptivity, right, is what Our Lady shows in her fiat. Let it be done unto me according to thy word, right? So receptivity for creatures who depend on God and for Christians who depend on Christ as their Redeemer, our fundamental disposition is receptivity. We receive grace from God. We receive our existence from Him. We don't act to achieve it. Um, And we receive grace from our Lord. We don't earn it. We don't produce it. Um, We're not Pelagians. Uh, So um, in that way, the traditional liturgy really strongly emphasizes the receptivity of the Christian, that that all this is a gift that God is giving to us. We didn't merit it, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not being given to us because we're special. We're special because God is giving it to us, right? Yeah. Um, and he gives it to us out of his free love. Not, and it's, it's a gift. It's truly a gift. Well, um, so. I think it's also akin to Martha and Mary, and Martha was very active in, in doing the busy work of, mm. of the house or whatever, and, and, um, you know, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and was present and was receptive of his time and his space and his love, and, and she received the better portion. 
Yep, that's that's you know what that's brilliant. I never thought about that. Oh brilliant. man, I, I've that's the first time Martha anybody's ever told me I was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad but, it's on the radio. I got to get. I got to make my wife listen this week. Oh, good, good. No, it's true. It, it's true because we all you know we all talk about Martha and Mary, right? And sometimes we even hear that applied to say religious life versus a vocation, a lay vocation in the world where. You know, we know that as laity, we have we have to build up the kingdom of God in the world, and that's very much a Martha-like vocation. It doesn't leave us a lot of time for, you know, prayer and study and reflection and, and so on. But we also recognize that the contemplative, you know, the Carmelite nuns or the Benedictine monks, right, they have chosen the better part. They are doing something which is inherently more worthwhile and ultimately more efficacious for the kingdom of God. Um, and that's that's a hard message for modern, Western, especially American people to hear. We are so activistic, right? We, we tend to think that the Carmelites and Benedictines are wasting their time. Like, why can't they be out there fighting for the pro-life cause, you know, in Washington or whatever, right? And we, we don't realize that without those people praying, we would all be toast, right? This yeah. world would be up in a, this would be a fireball a long time ago. Um, so I think it's very much like that with your, you know, your application is that the, the Marthas of the world are, are the liturgical ministers, right? They're busy. They're busy serving. Um, and they think that's great. And Jesus is saying, you know what? It would be better if you left that to the clergy and you just sat and you, and you drank it in, right? Yeah. That would be better for you. So I, the thing that I don't understand, going, sh- shifting our gears kind of back to the traditional Latin Mass, we have, at my parish on Sundays, we have three Masses. We have 7.30 a.m., 9 o'clock, and, and 11 o'clock. And since we have five little kids, uh, we tend to go to the 9 o'clock. Um, mm-hmm. I actually last week made it to the 7.30 just because our schedules didn't line up. So I was going to get to go by myself. So I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to go to 7.30. It's the first time I'd ever been. And it was better than the 9 o'clock because uh, everybody was quiet. There was less, you know, less people, which isn't necessarily a positive. But it was quiet ahead of time. I could pray. It was quiet after. Um, which part of that just kind of drives me insane in and of yes. itself is all the noise inside this, the sanctuary. Um, we have an 11 o'clock mass, which I call the rock band mass. Yeah. It drives me absolutely batty. There's, there's Sundays where I, I literally would prefer not to go. This is my personal preference. I'm not, you know, beating up anybody that's in the rock band or whatever. Um, but what I don't understand is that I, I've never once showed up at the rectory or the parish office and demanded that we disband the rock band mass because it doesn't speak to me. And yet it seems like there's that kind of vitriol for the Latin mass, even in places where they don't have it. And it's like, hey, we want to introduce another mass. Uh, you know, people kind of lose their minds for whatever reason. I, I don't understand yeah. that. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, no, you're, you're right that that is true. But I think, I mean, after everything we've discussed in this conversation, you can see that the Latin Mass is more than just the Latin Mass. That is to say, it represents a different vision of... Um, it, rep- <clears throat> it represents a different vision, a different set of priorities, let's put it that way. It puts the priority on the adoration of Almighty God. It puts a, it puts a premium on discipline, self-discipline, on, on silence, on um, recollection, on, you know, um, on, uh, you know on, on tradition, right? Which is not, tradition is almost a bad word in modern times. Yeah. You know? um, and, you know, it puts an emphasis on the clergy, right? The priest is very central in the traditional Latin Mass, and yet also kind of decentralized because you see his back, not his face. Right. He's, not, he's speaking in, in, in Latin, so he's, he's, a, he's a mere representative of Christ, so it's easier to see Christ shining through him, the high priest, um, precisely because there's no ad libbing and there's no good morning and all this kind of stuff. It's it's all that is completely gone. So it's it's it, but it's very um, hierarchical, and you know you are you are the layman kneeling in your pew and praying, and the priest is there offering the sacrifice on your behalf. You know, as a mediator, um, as we see, you know, in the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, so you know what I mean? It's so different. It's it's like it represents a different vision and a different set of priorities. And most people, I, I'm I'm afraid to say this, I think a lot of Catholics are just not ready for that. They're yeah. they they've been badly habituated against those priorities. Um, you know, they think that the mass is primarily a community event, maybe a sing along, self help, story time, whatever whatever it is, um, or just a chance to, you know, uh, to, 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 you know, to be with people and feel good about yourself. I mean, it's that whole feel-good mentality is completely absent from the Latin Mass. And if people are old enough, if they're very old, and they remember the Latin Mass, they either, love it, they either loved it or hated it, right? Um, that is to say, 
they loved it and they miss it, and maybe they would go if it was offered again. I, I know I know plenty of older people like that. Or they, for one reason or another, you know, they were in a grammar school and the sister whacked them with the ruler a bunch of times, or you know, they or there was a priest who was really strict and stern, and you know, and and that kind of filtered through the distorting lenses of memory and a lot of the weird catechesis of the 60s and 70s has made them into really, I would say, like fierce opponents of yeah. anything pre-Vatican II, right? Um, and so, you, you know, you have, to take, you have to take all these things into account. It's a pretty complex social, sociological situation that we're dealing with here. Yeah, one of the kind of the eye-opening things for me in, in my uh, post-conversion, one of my, you know, we have multiple conversions in life, right? So, was reading the book, and I always get the title wrong, The Lamb Supper, or The Supper of the Lamb by Scott yeah, Hahn. Yeah. I can't remember which, but, you know, uh, he he lays out the entirety of the Mass and the fact that it's a sacrifice, and he goes through the, the four cups that, you know, Jesus went through at the Last Supper, and um, right. and that the Mass is, you know, brings us into communion with heaven. There, in going to even just the one time— um, to the Latin Mass, it, it is one hundred percent about the sacrifice of the Lamb. Yeah, to me true. anyway, and the one that I went to, I don't know. Maybe the, uh, I'm assuming no, it's, it's probably always that way. Whereas to your point, I, to me the 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 Novus Ordo there, there's nothing that points to the fact that it's a sacrifice in the, in in the or at least nothing in the idea that would make you feel like it's a bloody masculine sacrifice to God. I yes. guess so to speak. Yes. Yes, that's right, right. Or, you know, I mean, unbloody in mode, but it's right, the, right, it's right, the right. representation of the bloody sacrifice right. of Calvary. Right, it's so I, softened. Yes. Yeah, it's true, and I, I, think, I think that there are many reasons for that. Um, let me just throw out a few. Um, one, one is that the, the Novus Ordo is trying to do multiple things. It's, I mean, the, the Old Latin Mass is really oriented towards um, offering up this awesome sacrifice with adoration of God. I mean, that's, it's, it's so focused on that, that even the reading of Scripture, the way it's integrated ceremonially into the Latin Mass, makes it very clear that it's, it's sort of poised in that direction. It's not just like a separate piece that's there for instructional purposes. Um, but in the Novus Ordo, it seems like it's trying to do many different things. It's trying to read a bunch of Scripture for the, for the instruction of the people, and it's trying to make them feel like a community worshiping together. Um, it's, and it's and trying it's, to compete and, with Protestant megachurches at yeah, this point. And, and it's trying to, you know, offer up this meal slash sacrifice, you know. And so it, it loses focus. It's like a blurred photograph. It's not clearly one thing, and that makes it hard to grip, hard, hard to grasp. What is it? What are we doing here? You know, um, and I think that uh, you know, being sort of inveterate materialists as we are, as fallen human beings, um, if somebody were to ask us, you know, well, what is the Mass about, we'll tend to fall back on what our senses tell us, not not what our intellect, maybe, you know, what we might have learned in fourth grade or whatever, but if, if we were lucky, but we're going to fall back on what it looks like, and what it looks like in most places is not the sacrifice of Calvary. Um, that is, you don't get that sense, as you, as you rightly said. The other factor here is the vernacular, you know, the fact that... Um, it was said that vernacular was going to be such a great advance because now we would finally understand what's going on. But the fact is we can't understand what's going on at Mass. It's, right. a, it's a totally divine mystery. We can, we can understand what the prayers are saying, but that's not the same thing as understanding what is going on. And our vernacular language is our comfort zone. So when you start hearing lots of vernacular, you can tune out so easily. But if you're thrown into a church where it's silent, you can hear a pin drop, and a priest is, is you know, is... is is whispering some Latin words so that you're like, whoa, I've, I've just left the world behind. I am in a sacred sphere now. I better be on my best behavior. Maybe I even better use a missile to, you know, to follow. Well, and I was going to say, if you know how to read, you can follow along. I mean, the, the yeah. literacy rate is astronomically higher today than it was in the 1500s. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so if, if people but, then literally couldn't follow along. Well, yeah, and see, this, but this is the whole point. Is that is that the people in the 1500s, they didn't care so much about following every word right. because they knew what the Mass was, and right. they united themselves deeply to it interiorly. And they had, actually, their own devotions, which, you know, the liturgists hate this kind of stuff. But there were devotions that developed sort of tandem with the Mass so that people, lay people could enter into the spirit of the liturgy, even if they didn't know exactly what the priest was praying. And so there was a deeper actual participation going on there than there often is now with the vernacular. So it's a huge irony, but I think it makes sense when you, when, you, know, when you think about this. If you, make, if you make the Mass too easy to follow, um, then people actually stop working at it, and they stop trying to follow it. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just... Well, I, and I, I think that that's a, a symptom of our culture at this point. I mean, everything in life outside of even the church is like, 
it, we have to make everything the lowest common denominator, right? right. We, and we it ha- has to be like one click, right? Right. <laughs> we have to, you know, even in law, right? They always say we, it has to be understandable to like a fifth grade level. And, you know, in the church is basically the same. We said, you know what, we, it has to be understandable to like the fifth grade level. Yes. Clearly, yes. that's not what people long for. Um, it, I mean, the you know, the numbers at mass and in the seminaries and to vocations would would sh- would support the fact that this is this has been new coke it's time to switch the ketchup back to red and yes uh, so on that line and, and then I'll let you go and and again so appreciate you having on for a young priest who's going into that parish uh where they have you know rock band and they have whatever but they don't have a traditional latin mass if he was going to try if he if he had one hill to die on uh, which it might be the case in some parishes. Uh, what would be the thing that you would think that, you know, if you could change this one thing, it might start to send an entire parish back towards right. the tradition? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and a difficult one. Um, and I, I've, I know a lot of priests who've tried different things. There are two basic strategies. One is the incremental the, or the gradual strategy. Let's let's try first to, you know, to tell the the choirs, okay, well, you don't have to give up these, these hymns you're using, but you do need to start singing these antiphons, you know, or so just bring in some chant, some ch- a chanted ordinary of the Mass uh, or something. Okay, fine. So you can, and then you can just sort of slowly build step by step. And then I'm going to have an altar boy club, and we're going to teach the boys, you know, a really strict, beautiful, orderly way of serving. And, you know, the girls are not going to be interested in that. And so then we can sort of gradually phase out the altar girls, whatever. So, you know, there are, there are different st- Gradual strategies. Um, the the problem is that every step of the way, it's a, it's a battle, and 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 people's feathers are going to be ruffled the wrong way, and you're going to get division in the parish between the younger people who want the more traditional things and the older people and the boomers and so on who don't want it. You know. Yeah. Well, and, and so, a lot of priests. I mean, in our diocese, anyway. I mean, you know, every three or four years, they're going to move to a different right. parish, and and that's very depressing for priests because they know they're I constantly could, fighting. I could, I could expend so much energy bringing this parish to a more reverent way of worship, and then my replacement will just undo all of it. Um, and that's, I'm telling you, that's one of the worst things right now. And we, we'd have to have a whole separate interview about the state of the diocesan clergy and how demoralizing our system is on them. But let me just say, the other strategy is, instead of trying to make little gradual tweaks, which are so difficult, the other thing to do is to say, I'm going to start up a Latin Mass, and it's going to be you know, maybe initially once a month on a first Saturday or first Friday at some time where I don't have to replace a different, uh, an existing Mass. It's just a new thing. A lot of parishes, I've been surprised to find, don't even have Saturday morning Mass. So Saturday morning can be an optimal time for introducing the Latin Mass. Um, and just doing that once a month and then maybe moving up to once a week uh, and not forcing it on anyone, but just making it there, um, that can often be like establishing the beachhead in the parish for um, a more reverent and a more Catholic way of worshiping. And it, it, it you know, um, it, that also has its difficulties, but at least it, it kind of avoids the battles over what we're going to do in the Novus Ordo, because the, the, the traditional Latin Mass is just what it is. It's got its own, you know, set of rubrics. You've got to do it this way. So in that way, you know, maybe that can be a, another strategy. But it's, you know, there's, it's, there's no one-size-fits-all. It's got to be a discernment with each you know, each parish. Yeah. Well, no, to your point, nobody said that being a priest was an easy job. Uh, I would, I would, I so appreciate you coming on. I'd love to have you back to talk about the plight of the diocesan priest. I think that sounds like a, a fantastic title for, uh, for a, a reoccurrence of, uh, Peter Kuznowski on Catholic spirit radio. Can't wait. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is Jason Bramley with Catholic conversations on Catholic Spirit Radio 89.5. You've been listening to Catholic Conversations with Jason Bramley on Catholic Spirit Radio 89.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the generous support of Meyer Bramley Insurance, serving Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas. Meyer Bramley Insurance can be reached online at mbi.agency or via phone at 844-890-2626. Catholic Conversations, where we talk about faith, family, and finance. Download our podcasts at catholicspiritradio.com. Come.